Hi, welcome to another Real Time Faith lesson discussion for early teens class. It's a blessing and an honor to have you with me as we study together and learn from God's Word. Now this week's lesson, the topic is withholding judgment. Withholding judgment. Now have you ever found yourself in a situation where you said something about someone or something, thinking that this is definitely true, and you've made your judgment, only to find later that your judgment was wrong, what you said was wrong. It's embarrassing, isn't it? And it, you wish that you could take back the words. But many times we shoot out the mouth and we forget to think. Many times we think we're experts. Many times we think the matter is straightforward and we pass a judgment only to realize later that we were wrong. One of the things I learned from my, my uh, professor who is now dead, he passed away a few years ago. One of the things he told me, see, he was an old wise man. And one of the things he told me was this, that I should always look at both sides of the story when I want to make a judgment about something. You may hear something that's so bad, so wrong about someone, and you may try to quickly pass judgment on them. But remember, there's always two sides to a story. And many, many times, if in fact all times, I have found that listening to both sides of the story makes a big difference. You know, we are all quick to judge, but we need to be patient. We need to be patient. We need to be slow to speak, slow to anger, and quick to listen. My brothers and sisters, are you quick to judge? Our lesson this week is about withholding judgment. And the memory verse from it, the text that the lesson is based off, is from Matthew 7 verses 1, 2, and 3. And Jesus tells us in those verses that don't judge unless you want to be judged. For the judgment with which you judge will also be measured back to you. The way in which you judge someone else will also be measured back to you. You will receive the same style of judgment, the same way of judgment. Everything will be done the same. So if you want to judge someone, be careful. And then Jesus says in verse 3, Why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye when you have a big log in your own eye, a big plank of timber? in your own eye. First, remove the log that is in your own eye, the plank that is in your own eye, and then you will be able to see clearly and help your brother who has a speck in their eye. Now, is Jesus telling us not to judge? Obviously, Jesus is telling us that we shouldn't judge. What He is telling us is this, that to judge, we must first be fit to judge. To judge, we must first have our eyesight, our spiritual eyesight. Whatever is blinding us needs to be removed. And many of us are blinded by one thing or another. And many times we think we can see, but we are blind. And Jesus is therefore telling us to first receive our sight before we go and try and help someone to be corrected. Jesus wants us to judge, but Jesus wants us to do it properly. We should be first fit to judge before we judge. Now there's more to judgment. There's another aspect to judgment that we all need. And before we go further into the lesson to look at that, please close your eyes, bow your heads, and we'll pray together. Our gracious eternal Father, our God and King, Father, we thank you for who you are and we thank you for the opportunity to fellowship together. Please, Lord, bless us as we go through your word and please help us, Lord, to retain something that may impact our lives. We thank you, Father, for everything. We ask you this prayer in Jesus' mighty and holy name. Amen. Now, as I said, our lesson this week is withholding judgment. Is it good to withhold judgment? And many times, as I said, we are quick to judge. We are quick to pass judgment on others. We are quick to say someone is wrong. Someone has done something bad. This person has fallen short. But many times we are too slow to understand. Many times we are too slow to hear the other side of the story. But does that mean we should not judge at all? Now to help us understand all these things and what we should do, let us look at the story in the Bible. 
Now in the book of Numbers, Numbers 35 to be exact, God told the Israelites, prepare cities of refuge so the person who accidentally kills someone can run to it and they can find refuge there because someone will try to avenge the blood of the one who is slain. So the person who has slayed the person the, who has killed someone should run to that city of refuge, especially if they have done it by accident. They have not intended to kill the person. Maybe it was out of self-defense. Maybe while they were chopping in the woods, the axe had slipped off and then knocked the other person on the head and killed them. Maybe they were driving the cart along and the horses took off and the person was walking across the road and it killed him. It was by accident, not by intention. There was no hatred in it. God said those people can run to the cities of refuge and find refuge there. And in Joshua chapter 20, in Joshua chapter 20, he tells Joshua again, assign these cities, because now you have conquered and you have taken cities, set aside six cities as I told you before, as I instructed Moses, now set aside six cities, cities of refuge. And the person who slays someone accidentally can run to these cities of refuge and find refuge. And there were conditions attached to it so that they could avoid the person who wanted to avenge the blood of the slain person. The conditions were this, that the one who has accidentally killed someone must stay there until judgment comes. They must stay there until the judgment for their case has been passed. Or they stay there until the high priest dies. And once the high priest dies, then they can be free or once the judgment is passed on their case, then they can be free to come out and return to their homes, which they were in before. Otherwise, they have to stay there for the rest of their lives. And it was a city of refuge. Now, do you think a city of refuge is essential today? Do you think we need a city of refuge? Truly, there's no city of refuge in the world today. But there is a city of refuge spiritually. Somewhere you can run to, somewhere I can run to, when we are in need of help. When we find that judgment is upon us and we need to run there for safety. There is a city of refuge we can all go to. But to help us understand what that city of refuge is, I want to share another story with you. And that story is about the woman caught in adultery. And if you have your Bibles, it's found in John chapter 8. So if you want to turn with me there, we can look at the story in John chapter 8. And I will try to recite as much of it as possible. Now in John chapter 8, Jesus comes to the temple early in the morning after being on, being on the Mount of Olives. And Jesus comes to the temple and he's teaching in the temple. And a woman is caught in adultery and she is brought before Jesus. And she is thrown down there. Or maybe she is pushed through the crowd to stand in his midst. And then the people ask Jesus. They tell him, this woman was caught in adultery. Now the law of Moses says for us to stone her. What do you say? What do you think Jesus said? Jesus didn't say a word. In fact, Jesus knelt down, he crouched down, he stooped down, and he wrote on the ground, on the ground of the temple. He wrote there. And as he was writing, the people kept asking him, Hey, come on, answer our question. This woman was caught in adultery. What do you say her judgment is? Should we stone her, as Moses says in his law? Of course, all of this was a trick. If Jesus were to say stone her according to the law of Moses, then they would report to the Romans that Jesus was trying to usurp the authority of the Romans. And then if Jesus said don't stone her, then they would say that he is trying to go against the law of Moses. So it was a trap against Jesus. But here Jesus in his wisdom, after writing, stands up and then tells the crowd, He who is without sin, let him cast the first stone. He who is without sin, let him cast the first stone. 
And Jesus knelt back down and he continued to write on the ground. Now there is one of my favorite authors who I believe is inspired. And this author said that Jesus was writing the sins of the people on the sand. So as he was writing the sins of the people on the earth, they noticed their sins that Jesus was writing. They noticed that they were also guilty of breaking the same law of which they were now accusing the woman. So one by one they started to leave, starting from the oldest to the youngest. And of course, the one who led the whole, this whole commotion, the one who had inspired everyone to come and try and accuse this woman, to try and deceive and catch Jesus, was none other than the devil himself. And I'd like to believe that he was the first one to walk away. And after the devil walked away, every single person walked away. Every single one. And Jesus, after a while of writing, he stands up and he asks the woman, Woman, where are your accusers? Does anyone condemn you? And the woman answered, No one, sir. There is no one here who condemns me. Then Jesus turned to her. Jesus said to her, Neither do I condemn you. Neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. Go and sin no more. Neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. Here is the difference between the, the judgment of Jesus and the judgment of the people. See, the people were filled with hatred. Their motive was destruction, not salvation and love. So when they brought the woman, they were seeking her death. They were not seeking her redemption. And here Jesus, although he judged the woman, you see, he judged the woman by letting her know that what she was doing is sin. And he said it so well and so subtly, but yet so direct. Neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. You have been sinning, yes. I acknowledge that, that's a fact. But go and sin no more. Jesus was interested in her salvation. And Jesus knew that she could be saved. Jesus knew that she could be saved. All she had to do was to go to a city of refuge. You see, my brothers and sisters, believe it or not, this woman was brought to the one who was in fact the city of refuge. This woman was brought to the one who alone could save her. The Pharisees, the Sadducees, the Jews, the Jewish leaders thought that they were going to have this woman killed, or if not Jesus. They were going to do something. They were going to achieve something. But their plans were thwarted. Instead of having the woman condemned, they brought the woman all the way to her salvation. You see, Jesus is the city of refuge that is stated in the Old Testament. If you look at Proverbs 18 verse 10, it tells us, The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. And the righteous, they run into it and they are saved. My brothers and sisters, Jesus Christ is the strong tower. You and I can run to Him and find salvation in Him and be saved. Jesus is the compassionate, ever-loving Savior. And when this woman was brought to Him, when they brought her for condemnation, when they brought her for death and destruction, here she came and found her city of refuge. Here she came and found the high priest, who when he would die, would set everyone free. You see, my brothers and sisters, Jesus is the one who has paid for all our sins. He has taken it upon Himself. And when He bled and died upon the cross, all our sins were wiped out. All our sins were wiped out. For those who accept His pardon, all their sins are forgiven. Every single one, no matter whether you committed murder before, whether you have committed the vilest form of adultery, whatever you and I have done, Jesus forgives. 
But here is the catch with forgiveness. Here is the catch with forgiveness. God can cleanse us from anything. As he says in 1 John 1 verse 9, as John says in 1 John 1 verse 9, he tells us to confess all our sins to God, for He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Yes, God can cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But in Jesus' statement to the woman, this is the condition for, for forgiveness. Here is the condition for forgiveness. Go and sin no more. If we truly want to accept the pardon offered to us by Jesus Christ, my brothers and sisters, listen carefully. Let us go and sin no more. Once we run to that city of refuge, which is Jesus Christ, we have to abide there until the judgment is complete. We have to abide there until the high priest's sacrifice is fully offered. And then we are free. We have to claim in fullness the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. And then we are free. If we come out and we do not abide in the city, then the avenger can slay us anytime. My brothers and sisters, Jesus Christ is our city of refuge. And it is by His compassion, His mercy and His grace, we are saved. And in the same way, Christ expects us to judge others, but to do it with compassion and love, to do it with the motive of saving someone, not with the motive of destroying someone. My brothers and sisters, I hope this lesson has reached you in some way. And next time when you want to judge someone, keep it in mind that we have been shown such great mercy that we should first try to save others, not try to destroy. Let's not be quick to condemn. Let's be slow to speak, slow to anger, and quick to listen. Remember what judgment we judge with, it will also be applied to us. What measure we mete out will also be measured back to us. My brothers and sisters, I thank you for joining me in this lesson. May God bless you as you contemplate it, and may He continue to work out His salvation in you and I, our lives. Let us pray together. Our gracious and eternal Father, our God and King, Father, we thank You for Your love. We thank You for Your mercy. We ask for Your blessings. Please help us, Father. Please help us to run to You and be saved. Please help us to lay hold upon the horns of the altar, Help us, Lord, to find salvation in the name of Jesus Christ. Father, please bless your people. Give us the wisdom also to make judgment while we are on this earth. For as Paul has said, we will judge the world at one point in time, at the end of this world. And we should also be able to judge the small matters. But first, help us to be fit to judge. We thank you for your love, your grace, and your mercy. And we ask you this prayer in Jesus' mighty and holy name. Amen.